Good morning. Welcome to Dover First Christian Church. Whether you're joining us uh, here in person or you're at home online watching from there, uh, we're glad to have you as a part of our service, worshiping with us today as we kind of embark on a new adventure. Uh, today is the first day of our study that's going to take us through the core 52 books. Uh, we're going to break those up into smaller parts. Um, and so today we start a series that we're calling The Beginnings, which kind of focuses on four weeks out of the book of Genesis. Um, or as I was told, apparently it's about baseball, it's the B inning, I don't know, somebody thought they were being funny. See, they didn't think you're funny either. Um, how long would it take you, if you were to walk into your house in the evening after a long day, let's say you left for work or for family stuff, you're out of the house 7 a.m., 8 a.m., you're off for the day, and you come home after dinner time, it's one of those long 11, 12 hour days, you come back in the house at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night and you walk in, how long would it take you to realize that someone else had been in your home? And I'm not talking about like a burglar breaking in and smashing things. Like it was someone who was supposed to be there. But how long would it take you to notice that that bag of chips that was in the pantry when you left is now in the trash can because someone ate all of the potato chips? Or to notice that the light switches that you had all turned off when you left the house and somehow the bathroom light's on again and you know you turned it off this morning. Or to notice that there are a pair of socks that were supposed to be in the dirty clothes hamper that were lying six inches from the hamper because your husband doesn't know how to put dirty clothes away. I'm not pointing any fingers at anyone, just, you know, hypothetically speaking. It would not take very long, would it, to walk around your house and realize that someone else had been there in the time you had been gone. The evidence of their presence would be written in almost every single room. You would see it in the way furniture was arranged and the way the trash can was filled up and where the dirty dishes were. You would notice someone has been here. This is something like what Paul says happens when we begin to look at the world around us. That when we examine nature, the natural world, the trees and the stars, the, the sky, the, the animals around us, human body, when we examine creation, we see evidence of the presence of God. In Romans chapter 1, this is what Paul writes to the church of Rome. He tells them, he says, from the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. I want to say that again, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. What he means here is that when you look at what God has made, you catch a glimpse of his presence. That when you examine the created world, you not only see that God is here, but you see what he is like based on what he has made. So for example, if you find yourself outside on a clear night where the stars have lit the sky up, and you sit there and you count them and you're like, there are more stars than I could possibly begin to count. And you wrap your brain around the fact that they are thousands and millions and billions of light years away. Are these massive balls of fire with planets orbiting around them, more numerous than we can count and understand. What should happen to you in that moment is this sense of just how small you really are. That in a universe that big, who am I? And in that sense of smallness, you catch a glimpse of the greatness and the grandeur of God. That whatever, whoever could put those stars there, whoever could paint that masterpiece, whoever could make a universe this big must be incredibly powerful and incredibly sovereign and incredibly majestic. And in that moment, you catch a glimpse of what God must be like. Or if you've ever gone on vacation to the beach and you've gotten up early and you've sunk your toes into the sand just as the sky begins to light up in the morning. And that deep navy blue so slowly begins to lighten and suddenly the sky is awash in yellows and oranges and pinks. And in that moment that your breath is taken away at the beauty, at the goodness of that moment, you catch a glimpse of a God who must love beauty, who must love things that are good. Because why bother with something that looks like that if there is not goodness in the God who made it? Or perhaps it's sitting in a science class in high school studying human biology. 
fascinated at how all the amino acids line up to make these perfect little proteins and how these proteins work to make our body function and how cells work together to allow our, our body to heal and to function and to grow. And you start to read and you look at just the intricate nature. No machine has ever been designed that comes close to the complexity of the human body. You study and you look and you learn, and what you should take away is whoever put us together must be incredibly wise. There is a wisdom and a brilliance here that I cannot understand fully. In short, what Paul is saying is when you look at the world that God has made, not only do you get the evidence of his presence, you get a glimpse of his divine attributes. You know what he is like because of what he has done. As we begin this new series and we spend our time talking about creation, the one thing that should come is an overwhelming truth. Whether you're learning about the stars in the sky, the human biology, the animals in the jungle, or whatever, is that he is a God who is worthy of worship. He is great. Powerful and majestic and Sovereign and wise and good and loving. He is a God who is worthy of worship. Enders. With worship of the God who put the stars in the sky and who designed your body and who made it all. We sing how great he truly is. Why don't you join me as we worship this morning? Father, we see you and your fingerprints everywhere we look. May we never take for granted the beauty of your creation, the intricate design of all that you have made, the power that is on display. May we see your fingerprints everywhere we look. And may it lead us to worship you, the Lord of all creation. Father, receive our praise this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're going to go ahead and dismiss the kids back to class today. Let them go ahead and head on out as they make their way out. Just thought I'd start kind of this way is before we get to the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, which is where we're going to be uh, in a minute if you want to turn there. Genesis chapter 1. Um, it stands in unique contrast to every other account of the origin of the universe. Every other account of the origin of the universe begins the same way. And it doesn't matter if it's a modern scientific theory or an ancient Near Eastern idea from, you know, the Sumerians or from the Egyptians or someone else in the ancient Near East. They all begin the same way. They all begin with the assertion that matter is eternal. That the stuff that the universe is made up out of has just always been here. Okay, and it does chaos, and then out of this lake appeared these divine beings, and they then brought things into the order we now see. Now, sometimes on purpose, sometimes in the midst of their conflict, these gods fighting with each other, and the night and the day represent the sun god and the moon god and their eternal conflict. Okay, but the stuff that you touch and feel and see, it's just always been here, and the gods kind of brought it into order some way. The modern scientific theory doesn't believe that the gods emerged from some ooze, but they do believe that the matter has just always been here. In a different state and in a different form, and somehow through the combination of billions and billions and billions of years, combined with random chance, these molecules, this matter, align in such a way that a reaction happened and bursting forth out of that came what we see now. Billions of years, lots of chances, lots of opportunities, and things just kind of came into being. But at the heart of even modern scientific theory is the idea that stuff, matter, has been eternal. It's just always been. And the reason I want to start there is because when we begin the creation account in the book of Genesis, it could not be more clear in opposing this idea. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, clearly states, it says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And it stands unique among other worldviews in saying that it is not matter that is eternal. It's not the stuff that has always been here. It is God that is eternal. It is God that has always been here. God did not spring. God is the one who has been here since before the beginning, and he brought the other things into being. And the reason that's such an important foundational place to start because it changes everything about how you believe things function in this world. The difference between believing that things happen through random chance and we're just here and believing that we are created creatures changes your perception of every relationship, every action, every belief system. And so Moses, who's likely writing the book of Genesis in the midst of the Exodus and writing the book of Genesis for the people of Israel, who spent their last four centuries under the influence of Egyptian religion and Egyptian philosophy and Egyptian cosmology, begins, he says, the first thing I want the people of Israel to know when they begin to understand what this God we're following is like, the first thing I want them to know about Yahweh is he is the one who was eternal. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. He is the beginning of all things. And close. Now, if you're reading along with us in Core 52 this week, you're going to read the entirety of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 in your study this week. We're not going to read the whole thing this morning. Rather, what I want to do is point out what I think are two really key important truths about the creation story as it's told in the book of Genesis. And they have to do with how God creates. And I believe that the creation story reveals to us the greatness of God and the goodness of God side by side. So the first thing I notice is this kind of repetition of how God goes about creating. So I'm going to have Amber go and put these up on the screen. We're just going to kind of jump around and move through Genesis chapter 1 together, starting in verse 3. We need a storyteller. Nope, not do that one. Do we have any storytellers? We're going to do the scriptures first, then the video. I must have them in the wrong order. It says, then God said, let there be light and there was. Was light. And then we jump on down to verse 6. And it says, Then God said, Let there be light. And then we're going to jump down to verse 9. 
Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And then we're going to jump down to verse 14, if I have that one in there. Nope, we're going to do 11. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and it was so. You notice the repetition there, right? That God speaks, and it is so. That God says, let this happen, and it happens. And that's a remarkable thing. Don't let that, because I talk for a living, Okay. I have 25 minutes a week, I stand up here and ramble. And half, half the time, nothing happens. Some of you go to sleep. Some of you nod your heads and then go on about Nothing happens. I tell my kids, hey, pick up your toys, release the floor. I spoke and nothing happened. The only thing in my life that consistently listens to me is my Google smart devices. I say, hey, Google, play some music, and it plays some music. I, I'm just, full disclosure, I spent a little bit too much time this week researching if I could customize it so that when I said, hey, Google, let there be light, it would turn on the lights for me when I walked in. I haven't quite figured out yet. God spoke, and stuff happened. When God created, it was not an exertion. It was not a a hard effort. It did not take all that he had. He spoke, and the world came into being. Over the next few weeks, we're going to use these video clips that are a little bit silly and a little bit childish, and that's on purpose. It's from a series called What's in the Bible with Buck Denver. But they're going to kind of walk us through some of the theological truths we discover in the creation story in the book of Genesis together. So here's the first one of how the story of Genesis unfolds. We need a storyteller. Do we have any storytellers? I will tell the story. Oh, uh, not you. Yes, me, Chester Wiggins, master of the popsicle sticky puppet. Try to keep it brief. Okie dokie. And now, uh, through the magic of a popsicle sticky puppetry, we bring you the story of everything. Everything? Pretty much. God, the man, the world. It's a genesis, man. It's the beginning of everything. Okay, let's hear it. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... I think you're telling the wrong story. What? Oh, you're right. (laughs) Here we go. A long time ago, right about uh, here, uh, there was God. God is a cloud? It makes about as much sense as showing him as an old man with whiskers. I see your point. The Bible says God is love, but when we tried to show him as a heart, he just looked like a valentine. Mm, Too hallmark. Right. He appeared to the Israelites as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The fire thing was a little scary. So we decided to go with the cloud. I think we made the right choice. I couldn't agree more. And we're calling him he, not because God is a boy, but because the Bible calls him he. Both men and women came from God, so he isn't one or the other. You know, this show can only be so long. Right, Uh, sorry. On with the story. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. No planets, no stars, no trees, no iguanas, no toaster ovens, no kids, no eyeglasses. Chester! Nothing! Just God. And then he created. He spoke, and the universe came into being. He must have had a loud voice, because it made a big bang. (laughs) Get it? A big bang? That's an astrophysical joke. Anyway, the earth was formed and cooled and water appeared. Then God caused the plants and the fish and animals to pop up. And then he said, watch what I'm going to do next. This is going to be great. And boom, he made a man and a woman. They didn't have any clothes, so they had to stand behind the bushes whenever anyone took their picture. What? You know, for kids' Bibles and stuff. And the creation was a done. So you're going to learn about creation from puppets and popsicle stick feeders, and it'll be okay. <laughs> Is it Kermit the Frog? No, no Kermit the Frog. Uh, sorry. Uh, you'll get to meet Sunday School Lady next week, though. She's a, she's a lot of fun with her magical flannel graph board. And they think I'm joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> So you and I, we, we create things too, right? You may not think of yourself as a creator. Maybe you do, but you create. If you've ever made dinner for someone, you have created something for them, right? You have put together and brought out a dish worthy of being eaten 
or not, depending on how good of a cook you are. Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever made anything where you've painted or you've drawn or maybe you scrapbook or you use your cricket to make custom t-shirts for people or you go out to the wood shop and you whittle and you carve or you construct things, you've built a home, you've laid brick or so. We are creative people in part because we're made in God's image and God is creator and so we create because we're made to be like him. We'll talk about that more next week. But when you and I create, we don't create the same way God does. For example, I brought some Play-Doh this morning. I can create with my Play-Doh. I have, I have three go-to shapes, okay? I can do the flat smash and make a pancake, okay? Or if you want, it could be a piece of pizza or it could be a, a taco shell. You notice how they're all around food. That's not a coincidence. Um, don't eat the Play-Doh. It's not good for you. Um, I, I can also do the long rolly thing, right? Okay, we can have a hot dog, or if we keep rolling, we can maybe make it into a piece of spaghetti, or if you misbehave, it can be a whip, and I can smack you with it. Some of, never mind. Um, and I can make a ball. Okay, I can make a, a basketball, or a golf ball, or a tennis ball, or a bowling ball. I got all kinds of balls that I, the sun, the earth, the planet, a donut hole to get back to our food theme. Okay, that's the extent of my abilities. But you'll notice that when I make them, you'll notice two things that are different about how I create and how God creates. Number one, when I create, it takes exertion. It is a very hands-on activity. My, my fingerprints get all over it. I actually have to mold and shape the Play-Doh into what I want it to be. What I don't do is say, hey, Play-Doh, turn into a hot dog, and it listens to me. When you bake in your, your house, you don't walk over to the pantry and go, hey, could you make some lasagna? And poof, there's a pan of lasagna in front of it. That's not how it works. If you're going to make something, you have to physically engage with it. You go get the ingredients. You prepare them. You season them. You put them in the pan. You bake them. And then comes something. When God created, there's no evidence that there was physical exertion on his part. God spoke and it happened. So great is his power. The second thing that is incredibly distinct is no matter what I make, even if I turn into a master sculptor, I go take pottery classes and I learn how to sculpt the Michelangelo out of Plato. Okay, and I stand up here and put all the little pieces and, you know, and it's just beautiful. No matter how beautiful the thing I create is, I have to have something to start with. I have to have the chunk of clay, the chunk of Plato in my hand and then I can create something. If you're going to make a, a scrapbook page, you use pictures and paper that you already have and you make it into something new. If you're going to make a quilt, you use scraps of fabric or, or quilting material that you already have. You create from something that already exists. When God created, he created what we call ex nihilo, out of nothingness, from nothing. There was God and nothing else, and then God spoke, and there was everything else. God said, let there be light, and it was so. God said, let the water separate from the land, and it was so. God said, let the earth populate and fill with animals, and it was so. God said, and it was so, over and over and over again. And when you read the creation story, you should be overwhelmed by a sense of the greatness of God that the manner in which he brings things into being is a display of his power. It's a display of his sovereignty, that he is king, lord of all creation, as we say. It is a display of his self-sufficiency, that he doesn't need anyone or anything to bring them into being. You should be overwhelmed with the greatness of God, how great thou art indeed. But the second thing you should notice is the goodness of God. That when God created, it was not just a display of his power, but a display of his goodness. Every single day of the week, as you read through the story this week, you'll come to the end of each day, and it will say the same thing. And God saw what he had made, and it was good. We'll just read it once for your benefit today, all the way at the end of the chapter in Genesis 1, verse 31. It says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came and then morning, the sixth day. And what that means for us is that all the brokenness and chaos of our world is not on God. That when God created things, he made them the way they were meant to be. He made them with goodness and holiness and righteousness. He made them in perfection. They were good when he was done with them. And all of the darkness and suffering and brokenness that we wrestle with 
Did you read the news this week? It seemed like every morning you wake up and there's an, another story about another shooting. One in our own backyard in Canton this week. That's not God's original plan for creation. When you read about the hurting and the suffering and the hunger and the death and the disease and the grief and the mourning, that's not God's original plan. When it was made, it was good. And in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about the fall and the curse and how sin began to distort the goodness of God's creation. But creation in and of itself is an expression of the holiness and righteousness and love and goodness of our God. When he was done creating, it was very good. And so we read this story and we see the greatness of God, the power of God on full display, and the goodness and holiness of God on full display. Now, one last connection I want to make for you, and then we'll wrap up for the morning. So as we walk through this Core 52 series, we are studying what is called systematic theology. And that's a word you may or may not be familiar with. Here's what it means. Theology is the study of God, and systematic means we're going to do it in an order that makes sense within a system. Understood in terms of academic circles, what it means is we're going to look at the major truths of Scripture. And rather than look at one passage, we're going to look at what the whole Bible says about that idea. What does the whole Bible say about creation? What does the whole Bible say about being made in the image of God? What does the whole Bible say about sin? And we're going to look at the breadth of Scripture as it paints the picture of these truths, rather than a more um, exegetical study where we're going to preach through Psalm 23 for six weeks and look at every single verse in depth. And so it's a broader study, but it gives us a fuller picture of what God is like. And so when we take this idea of creation and we see the beginning of that doctrine in Genesis 1, and we look at where else it pops up in Scripture, we find something really fascinating. So the people who would read Genesis 1 and later write the Psalms and the Minor Prophets, when they talked about creation, they would write things like, for the heavens were made by the word of the Lord, for creation was made by the word of God. Which doesn't seem like that big of a difference from God said and it was so. Right? This is kind of the same idea. But what they're preparing us for is what would happen when Jesus comes along in John chapter 1. They're laying the groundwork for this idea that creation came into being by the word of the Lord. And when we get to John chapter 1, we figure out what that actually means because we meet the word of God. Not just the spoken word of God, but the word of God, the person, namely Jesus Christ. So when we come to John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, this is what it says. I think I have that one on the screen for us. If not, I'll read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. We find out in verse 14, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us, right? This is Jesus. There's no mistaking when John starts his gospel in the beginning, he wants your mind to go back to the other time you read those words, that you would connect John 1.1 and Genesis 1.1 and go, oh, we're back at the beginning. And in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, and he was with God in the beginning. And nothing that came into being, nothing that was created was made without him. All things were created through him. When you're reading this week, your author, Mark Moore, will use this analogy. He says, God the Father functions as the architect. He's the one who says, I think we should have some light. Let there be light. And God, Jesus, God the Son, functions as the builder. And he goes, okay, let me go get some light. Let there be animals. And the builder goes and provides animals. Let there be, and Jesus does the work. Because we read not just in John 1, but in Colossians 1, and again in Hebrews 1, this repetitive idea that though God the Father is the one speaking in Genesis 1, it is Jesus the Son who's doing the work of bringing creation into being. He's the one ordering the chaos. He's the one lighting up the darkness. He's the one bringing life where there was none. And here's why that's important. Because as Christians, the core of our faith is this. We recognize the brokenness of our world, the brokenness of our hearts, the brokenness of our lives. And we believe 
that God is capable of restoring what is broken. We believe that God is capable of creating something new where we have broken what was old. We cling to passages like 2 Corinthians 5. New creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We cling to the promises of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth and there were no more tears and no more suffering. We cling to this idea of new creation. And so here's why it's important to understand the doctrine of the original creation. Do you ever have days, do you ever have days where you wonder if God can actually keep those promises? I mean, look at the mess we have made of this world. Look at the chaos and destruction and death and brokenness. God, are you sure? Are you sure you can recreate this? Have you seen what we have done? Have you seen the damage that we are doing? Have you seen how angry we are and how wicked we are and how unkind we are to one another? How broken? Are you sure you can do that? And do you know how we can be sure that God can step into this chaos and bring order and life? Because he already did it once. Because he's already done it. Do you ever wonder if God can really make something good out of the brokenness that is in your own heart? God, I'm, I'm angry all the time. God, I, I can't even control my own tongue. God, I, I have these feelings and thoughts that I try to fight and they just keep coming back and I'm battling this and I want to be better, God, but I can't. God, are you sure you can fix what's wrong in me? Can you make, you promise you're going to make me good. You promise you're going to make me whole. How can I believe that? Do you know how you can believe that? Because God already created once. And when he was done, it was very, very good. And so when Jesus comes along and says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a brand new creation. That means God has the power to heal whatever is broken, to fix whatever is wrong, to restore whatever is lost. And when he is done, it will be very, very good. See, if our hope is going to be in the new creation, then we must believe with all of our hearts in the original creation and the greatness and the goodness of the God who brought it into being. And we're going to prepare our hearts for a time of communion this morning. And the, the reason we do that is because our hope of a new creation, our hope of being restored, lies in Jesus, the Word of God. The one who brought the first creation into being. The one who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And the one who suffered and died and conquered the grave so that he could promise us new life. Our hope of a new creation is found in Jesus and the work he has already done at creation, at the cross, and at the empty tomb. And because of that, we can hope in a future when all things are made new again. Because of that, we can be made new in the here and the now through the blood of Jesus. And God created once and it was very good. And through Jesus, he is in the business of recreating and making us very good once more. If you'd like that to be part of your story and you don't know Jesus, I'd love the chance to share the gospel with you even further. For those of us who do know what it is to be a new creation, this is our chance to reflect, to pray, and to thank our Savior for paying the price to make it possible. Father, we come to this moment to do exactly those things, to reflect on the truth of the story, to reflect on your suffering upon the cross, to reflect upon the death that you died for us, to thank you for the price that was paid, and to remember the hope that we have as new creations in Jesus Christ. Father, in this moment, draw very near to us that we might feel your presence and know those truths. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Jesus, although he was fully God, was also fully human. He understands what it's like to be tempted. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus was tempted in every respect, yet, unlike any other human, remained without sin. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to God's throne, that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. We are able to approach God's throne confidently because Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice so that we may not be punished in the way we deserve, but instead find grace. During this time of communion, let us remember Jesus' sacrifice, which gives us peace in knowing that we will always be forgiven. Dear God, help us to remember and thank you for these things. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us so that we may have peace and confidence in coming to you. This all in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to mention to those of you watching from home that if you have any requests you'd like us to include in our prayer time, uh, you can leave that in the comments here on Facebook and we'll include those in our prayer time. Beneath the Shade Ministries is an organization right here in Dover that seeks to take women who struggled with substance abuse and restore them to wholeness in Jesus Christ. This is exactly the kind of organization we want to partner with as we strive to be light in our community. One of the ways we're going to be existing beneath the shade is helping to build a deck so they have an outdoor living space when women move in later this fall. You can partner with us by donating to build this deck, by letting us know that you'd be willing to help us this spring as we begin construction, or by asking Josh about other volunteer opportunities at the Beneath the Shade house. We look forward to partnering with this wonderful ministry. We had a great beginning to our Campfire Faith this past Wednesday night, and we plan to keep it going for the next several weeks. Plan to join us this Wednesday night at 5.30 for dinner, and then at 6 o'clock for study of all ages. Beginning this week, we'll be tracking along with our Core 52 program. We hope to see you there. Today begins our year-long study of theology together through the program Core 52. If you already ordered a book, please pick it up in the foyer today. You'll notice that your group cards are inside the book, so you can begin setting up your discipleship group meetings. If you'd like a book and forgot to order one, or you'd like to be in a group and didn't sign up for one, see Josh after church today and he'll take care of you. If you supported our mission team this year by ordering flowers, your pickup day is just around the corner. Flowers will arrive on Thursday, May the 6th, and you can pick them up from 4 to 6.30 p.m., just in time for Mother's Day. Our mission team is planning their annual yard sale. They'd like you to start saving items you'd be willing to donate to sell in support of our mission team. The yard sale will be on June 11th through 12th this year, but you can start bringing in items on Sunday, June 6th. As always, the money raised by our mission team supports our mission work both locally with programs like Tough Bags and supporting Round Lake Christian Camp, but also around the world with mission teams as well as programs like our food packing. Thank you for your support. 
So just a couple things uh, to mention uh, specifically about Beneath the Shade. Uh, when you came in, if you did saw on the table out there, there are envelopes with kind of the logo of the ministry there. If you're interested in partnering with us in that way and donating uh, to that cause, you can just drop a check or a, a, some money in there. Uh, six, seven thousand dollars ought to do it. Um, so just two or three of you do that. We'll be in good shape. See, they didn't laugh for a service. People got out their checkbook. They just wrote no. <laughs> um, but we'd love to have you. I, I really, I really believe in the work Kathy's doing up there. I'm excited about that. We had a couple of people after service approach me some other ways they might help, which I thought was really exciting. So uh, if you're interested in being a part of that ministry, let me know and we'll help connect the dots there as well. Um, so, and Campfire Faith, I don't know what this Wednesday is going to look like. If you haven't looked at the weather, it's supposed to snow Wednesday. Um, so we may be inside somehow, some way. I don't, they don't make patio heaters big enough for 30 degrees and snow. Um, but we're, we are going to meet Wednesday. It'll just probably look different than what we're expecting. And, uh, but regardless of the weather, we'll figure something out and we'll be here for Bible study and dinner. Um, on Wednesday evening. So just so you know that that's coming up. There are other things you can read about in your bulletin, but uh, those are some of the, the big things going on. Uh, the other announcement I meant to make last week, and I forgot, uh, a few of you stuck around. Easter Sunday, uh, Josh Rogers approached me and goes, hey, I've been meaning to get back to you, but I don't want to bother you Easter week, but I am ready to do this whole baptism thing. And so I sent him home to get clothes, and after church Easter Sunday, uh, Josh was baptized and joined uh, the family and welcome to the church. So we want to welcome Josh. Uh, we're excited for him and his journey following Christ. You can clap. I see there are like four people going, I want to clap, but I don't want to be the first one. Um, so we get a chance to, to say hi to Josh. I meant to say something last week, but um, yeah, so we did that Easter Sunday right after church. Any prayer requests this morning before we, we dismiss? Okay. Okay, I'm going to go with Frankie because I don't know that I can do that last name. Okay. Okay. So just for those of you who didn't, uh, Frankie is a classmate of Cammie Huff's um, who was on the road to recovery from leukemia and they decided he needed to do another round of chemo. Things have kind of gone backwards, so we want to keep Frankie in our prayers. I saw another hand over here. Alice. Okay. What's his name? His name is Carol Smith. Something Smith. What's the first name again? Carol. Carol? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, a cousin of Alice Butcher's um, who got sent home on hospice care in Texas that we want to pray for. Friend, so a friend of Ray McClellan's named Kenneth, and they found out he's got cancer in his lower intestines, and he's headed in for a consultation this week. And, and passed away from a, uh, being shot yesterday. Um, and he has another friend, Cruz, um, whose uh, grandmother has been in hospice and just passed away. So two of Andrew's friends from down where he is in Texas. Um, and then a couple others that I'll just mention. Uh, we've been praying for Roxanne Dunn. That is D. Ray's granddaughter. Uh, she went to rehab on Saturday to start that, but... Um, there's still a lot of things. She's still got some tubes in, still doesn't have feeling below her waist. Um, just continue to pray for Roxanne. And then, of course, uh, the family of, of Bev Dale. We did services here uh, for Bev on Friday afternoon. Uh, but continue to keep Carol and Brian and Ricky and the rest of that family uh, in your prayers as they grieve the loss of Bev. Anything else before we close? All right, let's close in prayer. God, we, we come to you in prayer precisely because of what we talked about today. Because we believe in your greatness. We believe that you are powerful enough to speak things into being. We ask for healing for our friends, for those battling leukemia and cancer, those who've been sent home on hospice care. God, we, we pray for them. We know that you are capable of healing. But we also come because of your goodness. Because we believe you care for us and you want what is best for us. And that you seek desperately to restore all that is broken. And so God, we lean into your grace as well. Asking you to do what is best. Asking you to be present, to care, and to comfort those who are in need. We pray for Bev's family that they would know your goodness this week. 
overwhelmed by your love and peace. And Father, may we leave here full of hope. No matter what news we might get, no matter what might be on our prayer list, no matter what brokenness we might encounter, we leave here full of hope. For we believe that the God who once created all that is good is capable of doing that again. Restore us. Make us into new creations as we eagerly wait for the day when you restore everything else. God, we praise you for both your greatness and your goodness, and we put our hope in you as we leave this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. Have a great week. I'll see you Wednesday night. In the-